Like you heard, I'm an administrator, right? And you say, why would you want to have an administrator talk? Don't administrators give you all these wonderful things, make your life better all the time, right? Right? Oh, they do? Great. In California, when I go to a campus, it's like, I'm from the chancellor's office. I'm here to help. And they go, right. So really, what I've had to do, what's, what drives me in a principle is my job is to give a gift and not a burden, right? And understanding what your needs are. Before my road to ruin in administration, I was a professor of psychology uh, in cognitive psychology. And all the stuff that Sam talked about, about how people learn and think, really good things. Uh, just to reinforce that and all the things that, that's Paul, that Paul has talked about is too about open education resources. Just want to emphasize great messages that they have here. Now what I'm going to talk a, a bit about is a little bit more down into the weeds are some of the tools that are out there to help you assure the quality of the experience that the students have and what are the things that a designer like Brenda could do to help working with the faculty to make sure you have a quality online hybrid course. How do you make sure it's accessible? What are the tools that are available? Rather than say, make it UDL, make it accessible, and then you say, and how do I do that? So I'm going to try to highlight some of those practical tools so that when we work in the afternoon, we'll be able to show you some of that stuff. All right. So when, when we're looking about, just coming back here, the issue around quality assurance is really about trust. When you think about what are some of the barriers that are facing us in, in OER, in TAC program, is can I trust the stuff that you created for me to use it? And the question before about the publishers was around, well, we tend to trust them. Well, well what are the reasons why we should trust those folks? And what are the processes that we can build in to make sure we do that? Because how do we get our students to trust us? Is this going to be a really good learning experience? Is there variability in how I'm going to be assessed so I can demonstrate my skills and knowledge following UDL? Getting the faculty to adopt those things and also the employers, right? And, and these are symbols of trust become important. And your, your logo, for example, is you are saying that the content of this curriculum is essential. Now how, when someone goes online and goes to Skills Commons to find the material that, that, that you're creating, how is someone else going to know that that content has been developed in partnership with employers, has been um, evaluated by faculty skilled in areas? There are things that you can begin to do to add on in your submissions to the Skills Common Collection that can help build that trust. Describing that partnership, who is involved, in a sense the attributions of who authored the material really become an essential element. And that's partly what Creative Commons licenses do is help making it clear who has created this. The CC BY, it's BY WHO, right? The other aspect is now that you got the content have you organized the material? Have you created the activities in which the student can now learn these materials through their different ways of recognizing materials, audio, visual, tactile, et cetera, like that? And have you de designed those in ways that lead to a good educational experience? All right. The importance of this design process is why we have faculty, why we have departments. If it was all about content, we just put up a library and say, go forth and get your degree. But the way the design of the education is essential. And how many people have heard of Quality Matters? OK. So there's a lot of essential rubrics. The a Quality Scorecard by the Online Learning Consortium, you got that. The CSU, we created something called CULT. It's a free application, so we'll talk a bit about that. And then now, how do you ensure you're delivering it? So once I, can, I get a good designer to help me out, now what's the interactions that, that are really important when I'm using social media? So thinking about all these aspects, in particular, I'm going to highlight some of the things or what uh, Sam was talking about. What are ways that you can ensure, and how do you know if there's something has an alt tag? alternative text for an image. How, how would you go about doing that? It's important, right? But how, how would you do that? And I'll, again, I'll show you some of those things. And then just want to talk a little bit around kind of the demonstration of the learning experience, how that, that, that becomes very important. 
All right. So now we're going to end all these online programs. So the issue around quality content, and I promise Sue I'm going to zip through some of these things. We can talk about it. Really, in the skills commons, having methodologies of putting up a Word document that describes your process, and there are a lot of models up there. And another important aspect, and this is kind of what I think Paul was talking about before, about how do you really curate a collection? And Skills Commons right now is this repository of content. The first step is how do we capture the stuff so, so we can preserve it and other people can use it. The next step is going to be around how do we build curation of the content. And Merlot has been in the business uh, since 1997. We have 23 editorial boards based on discipline-based experts doing reviews of these things. And just so you know, this is, I think, what Paula talked about, building communities who have shared interests. What we do in our scholarship, we're going to be doing this in our um, in, in TACT and, and in uh, Skills Common. And to give you a sense of how these applications have been applied, Real quick, in California, we have about 3 million students across our higher education students. So I'm uh, one of the people helping out on developing California Open Online Library for Education. Where do you go find open textbooks? You can do these things. You can find, get open textbooks. But what's really important is around creating e-portfolios. Sam talked about e-portfolios, having faculty explain to, them, to their colleagues, I'm using an open textbook. How do I teach with it? What's my syllabus? Do you think that would help you in looking at the adoption of how you might want to use open education to find colleagues in my discipline teaching a course like I'm teaching? And that's, his, that's one of the real challenges. I, I ever try to get a syllabus from some other faculty member from another institution? Is that easy to do? It's where would I go? How would I find it? So building capabilities like faculty giving their, their stories of how they're using these resources, we're going to see these type of things. And we're using Merlot Content Builder. It's a free application for you to create these things. Simple. And, uh, and the other thing, we're beginning to organize the materials around book uh, tech, uh, courses. You think Accounting 110 is the same or different from what you teach in Colorado and California? What do you think? Oh, you think it's different, really? The basics of accounting? I think the numbers are different. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. why labeling gets really important. Correct, right. But, and, and, what we can, and what we've done in here, you can go click on these things and look through what are the content that is covered in a common description of these courses. And then what we're having our faculty do is doing the faculty reviews of evaluating the subject matter, the design, educate the edu editorial aspects. Suddenly, because the question came up around, how do I know if any of these open textbooks are any good? You trust your colleagues, right? They bring the experts, so we have those here. So, and in, in this case, just so you know, we have these reviews are done by community college faculty from the CSU. We have some UC faculty. In a sense, you have to draw upon the expertise in the community to have those, um, to contribute their knowledge and expertise because it's not, I think Paul's point about OER is not just about the content. It's about the community of people who work together to share their expertise. And how do you provide the tools to enable that? They're open educational services that help the adoption of resources. So these are the things we've been doing in Merlot for a bunch of years. We're going to be applying it. And I'm just going through an example here of how we're doing it for a particular California project. So these are rubrics out there, quality matters, well-established research, all this other stuff. You got to pay some money, but it's relatively inexpensive. And I would, you know, you may want to look out for your grants, become QM members, you can apply the rubric. And, and if you want a free one, um, uh, the CSU has one too as well. So in here we just kind of made it really easy. How do I find the free one that we're using in California? And you can go get more information. But how do you assure the quality of the instructional design? These tools are ready, rare and a go. I'd encourage you to use those things. So in Quality Matters, you can become certified as a trainer, master. There's all these cool things. And part of building trust in the curriculum that you're presenting is 
building the credentials around the persons. So these type of training can be really useful to support what you're doing in CHEO. So if you have people who are certified peer reviewers, QM peer reviewers who reviewed the instructional design, it helps put a little stamp of quality on that. Okay, Cult, quality online learning and teaching. We have rubrics aligned with that. And here are the general ones. You have overall design. I'm going to zip through this. Learning objectives. This is a critical aspect that I find um, in a lot of OER is left out, is not defining what are the learning outcomes that you really want to achieve. These are important aspects. And, and this is the value of a rubric, is that it becomes a reminder to you of what should I think about what others need in teaching the course. Because OER is about what others need. It's you produce it for the purpose of sharing. And trying to think about what are the assessment strategies? Are they comprehensive? Are they covering all the objectives? What are the forms of interaction? What Sam was talking about, what are all the different methodologies that someone has to engage the material becomes important. And these rubrics and each one, like you have forms of interaction, QM has four different things for you to think about. And the value of these tools is to help you keep on track because I think as David was saying early on, I'm overwhelmed. And I remember being a faculty member, you got, you know, three, four courses you're prepping, you got your committees, you got your research, and having to think through all the different elements to ensure the quality, this is very useful here. Here's some other information, here's some samples of what we're trying to do in, in California, again these are free for everyone, is to actually give samples of what, how people have implemented these, these rubrics. So you get a chance to see that, and we do recognition of people. Recognition is really important too as well. All right, And we actually publish in our website port institutional portfolios of how they are implementing quality assurance. Because again, if, if it's invisible, how does someone trust it? So what are your marks of quality that you can produce? And having an institutional portfolio of how San Bernardino is supporting and enhancing academic quality in online courses or faculty training and certificate, right? These are tools that are all there. You can take a look at these and say, hey, man, maybe I want to use this at uh, Pueblo Community College. What's our strategy for making this work? All right, quality and accessibility. Um, you know, just so my history, I'm a cognitive psychologist, right? Um, and, and in my uh, accidental travels as administrator, I now have the CSU's Accessible Technology Initiative under my portfolio. And in the CSU, we have 450,000 students. We have 12,000 who are certified within our Centers for Disabilities. 12,000. Uh, is this larger than some of your campuses? Right? Okay. You cannot make accessibility a marginal ad hoc process. If you're going to remember one thing, this is it. Make it a forethought, not an afterthought. That is the essential thing. Understanding, thinking about how you are incorporating accessibility in the design process. Thinking, essential. Important work, cast great expertise, stuff like that. All right. And here's their website, lots of stuff. Um, and, and there are lots of other things out there. The CSU has been working in this area too as well, so we have the UDL, and the point here is there are resources out here for you to learn more, all right? We also created in Merlot, working with the National Federation of the Blind, trying to create something focused on open education resources. Where do I go to find tools? Is there some expertise out there? Where do I find people who know what? How do I find open textbooks that have some accessibility reviews? trying to create these resources so to make your life easier. Um, one of the challenges um, in accessibility is it's really impossible for things to be 100% accessible. The combination of disabilities, technology, instructional design, the, the timing and needs and resources 
creates so many possibilities that it's impossible to cover all bases ahead of time. All right? But what, again, you want to think about what can I do to cover as many things as possible ahead of time. And what we've created is a, a little set of checkpoints, some practical things that you can look at to help make sure you're going to cover the majority of the issues for many people. And then what you always have to have all right, is if you have problems that aren't solved, how do I help you? You always have to have, in a sense, 508 says, Section 508 says, how do you make it accessible from the get-go? And then Section 504 is to make sure, if I can't, how do I ensure I provide you an equally effective alternative access to an educational experience so you can learn? So you always are going to have to have both of those things. And what you want to do is minimize accommodation as much as possible, but you always have to be prepared to, to exercise that. Okay. Now what I'm going to show you is, again, just some quick examples here. Um, uh, for example, in, uh, there's a Firefox, um, the Wave toolbar. Simple tools that you can check whether images have alternative text to that describes that important thing. So here's a DNA from the beginning. It's a resource that, that's in Merlot. And here's some pictures there. And you can, by looking at this tool, so the, in, the instructional designers here, you can see, is there any text displayed there, right? So you can check this out. Someone puts stuff together. How do you check it up real quick, quick and easy, versus this is an important cell. Sorry, this is an important image. But someone goes here. And it, you know, your, your uh, assistive technologies doesn't tell you what's inside here, image. Right? Now, you can then begin to say, well, how can I add that alt text? But the first thing is, how do I know if it's there or not? So these tools become very important. Okay. There's another topic called structural markup. Um, how many people uh, have used GPS getting around? Right? It's someone kind of telling you where to go, right? Now, assistive technology, just think about is GPS. And imagine you wanting to read a book. And what if you had to read every single word in the book before you wanted to get to the thing you wanted, and what you wanted was in chapter five? Right? Would that drive you nuts? Right? Well, structural markup in a text are like little landmarks. And think about like GPS, it'll say, um, you're at, you know, uh, 470, go 20 miles, right? And rather than saying, oh, you're going 27, 26, 25, da, 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 all the way, it's quiet for a while, right? So structural markup says, what's in, in the document that would allow me to, in a sense, tab through to get to what I want quicker? Because you do that when you're visual, when you can see stuff, I turn the pages. But what if you're blind? So structural markup are kind of landmarks that helps people navigate quickly through this, right? Well, how do you know if there's any structural markup? Again, there's a tool that allows you to look at that. And this is where the designers can be really helpful to help you say, how do I want to put these landmarks in there? And here's a case where someone, someone would have to hear every single word before they get to, oh, I want to get to mutation. And if you have to take five times as long to get to the content as a sighted person. Is that equally effective alternative access? Yet what does it take to make that happen? And a lot of times, if you created this in a Word document, make sure you use Word headings. And when you're indenting, don't hit five spaces. Hit the tab bar because, in a sense, it automatically creates some structural markup. Okay. Was that helpful? Okay. All right. Academic integrity, this is an important issue about student performance. And Paul talked about this as, as well. Because here's really <laughs> what, what we want to do. All right. No, no, it, it, I understand. Um, is you often feel like you're alone in this, right? And I think the value of the TAC program is really about how you're meeting as a group right now faculty, instructional designers, where you have a chance to share your practices in a way that's going to be more practical, effective, and tested. And 
And you, we can change the world by working collaboratively and much more successfully.